London Property, home of Super Prime, where you can find informative, educational and entertaining content covering all aspects of property. Hello and welcome to London Property, home of Super Prime. I'm your host Farnas Fazaipur and today we have the pleasure of being hosted by Druids in their offices in Pall Mall and in conversation with their Vice Chairman, Will Richards. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Farnas. Will, can you start by giving us a brief history of auction houses so that uh, we can all get educated by your wisdom? It is said that auctioneering is one of the oldest uh, businesses in the world. But really in its modern form, I think it probably dates, there's Stockholm auctions that started in the mid 17th century. But as we really know it, most of the big houses we know, Druitts, Sotheby's, Grissies and so on, were 18th century businesses. That really coincides with the start of antique dealers, modern types of collecting, the Grand Tour and so on. So really the models we know in terms of the art market were getting established largely in the 18th century. And I think in those days, it was largely house sales, estate sales, where you would put, put the collection of the house contents up for sale. Um, but I think it's transformed now. It's unrecognisable now in, in, in what the auction business does. I mean, the art market's worth $65 billion globally. About half of that is now auctions. We used to be mainly dealer-led, but auctions moved into that space. And it's about half of the world's uh, turnover in the art market is auctions. So... It's, it's transformed and it's not, it is about house sales. Everyone loves a house sale, collection sale. But they become experts in their own right in certain fields, whether it's jewellery, watches, you know, art or so on. So it, it, they become more specialised as well and the expertise is, is, the level of expertise is growing. So uh, with regards to who uses them, I guess, so it, it starts from the house sale. Yeah. And... Um, when, when you have a house sale, is, is it that everything in the house goes, goes into it or are you actually having specialist sales that, that, that focus on different items and different kind of genres? Absolutely. I think, it's, I think it's about what the client has and what the client wants to achieve. So in certain circumstances, a house sale is, is brilliant. It's a great marketing platform for a collection. They always um, achieve um, premium market returns, um, you'll get the widest access, the widest audience. So a house sale, when it works, it is great. And, you know, up to, uh, I mean, we're Druids are leaders in, in handling collection sales and house sales of that nature. And um, we see it often, it's a very efficient way and almost 100% of the items will be sold. They normally our sales double pre-sale estimate very often. But it only happens when it's relevant. I mean, if you have specialist items, then there's any number of specialist sales you might look at. You might look at, you know, if you had a Banksy, you might put it into our Banksy sales. So Druitts, I'm Deputy General Druitts and Forum, which is our, our sister company, which works on paper, which specialises in works on paper. So that's books or master drawings, but also modern prints and Banksy's, and it has 25% of the Banksy market. With a Banksy, you need to access that market. So you would put that in a specialist sale. It wouldn't necessarily be in a general house sale. So other specialist areas like wine and jewellery. So you need to, you'd need to look at what the client wants to achieve and talk them through the processes and the options and build a strategy uh, of auctions. But of course, that might involve private sales as well. So there might be an unusual item for which uh, a collector would pay a premium to keep it off market. So you could also look at private sales and, and where it would return, you know, better returns for the client uh, because of the nature of that market. Keeping things anonymity and keeping things off market can produce a premium in its own right. So a private sale is another way. So auction houses have really evolved into becoming a more broad advisory business than, than, than just um, house sales. So on that subject, what are the services that people could actually expect to go to an auction house and get? I mean, at a basic level, some auctions just you take your items there and they sell them. I think with the main auction houses, which is us and, and Christian Sotheby, people like that, it's become very different. Christian Sotheby have, have narrowed their focus to the very high end and mainly contemporary jewellery and luxury items. Um, and Druitz has moved into that space of the more country house, old master drawings, as well as contemporary art banks, as I mentioned, jewellery and watches. So the services you offer around that would be certainly auctions, obviously, valuations for all sorts of reasons. So you might want valuations for 
capital gains tax planning, for estate planning. You might have IHT valuations when a probate valuation is required. You might be wanting to negotiate um, gifts in lieu. We've just negotiated a, a, a work by a famous author back to Bodleian Library, and that was in lieu of inheritance tax. So that's another sort of advisory valuation role we have. So there's lots of there's lots of issues and valuations and planning required around collections, um, which happen before or after sales as well. So sales are part of it, but that valuation advice is, comes, comes as part of the, the client relationship. And what are the other things for collection management that, uh, that, that your, your companies, or group of companies offer as a service? So we've got, so Druitt and Forum and Bid for Wine are the auction um, arm of, of our parent company, which is Ger Johns. And Ger Johns are the largest international independent advisory business. So within our group, we have our auction function. So for a house sale or for a Banksy, then that's obviously the way to go. Um, but Ger Johns offer independent advice um, on collection management. We have a finance arm, which, um, which clients can access to fund acquisitions or dispersals of collections. Uh, we have Hatfields, the restorers, so you can, we can talk about curatorial responsibilities around collections and so on. Um, but really the model is that therefore, as a group, we give an independent advice that means that clients don't have to necessarily go to one client, or I mean one business or whether auction dealer or so on. So for example, uh, I've got a client at the moment, we're managing a house sale for them, which is going to be very interesting. I think, I think it'll be very well received by the market. But as a collector, they also have some other high-end impressionist art. And to go into that wouldn't be right in a house sale. So with our Ger Johns uh, colleagues, we can look at uh, managing that option for them with any number of solutions. So we'll look at private sales. We might look at a sale with a dealer. We might look at other auction houses, some visual Christie's um, impressionist art sale. So that they can get that, we can hold their hand through all the options and negotiate the best deal for them when we decide what the best strategy is. So for that end of that collection, that's the important bit. Obviously, for the house sale, it's, it's the highest profile house sale for the rest of that collection will be the best option for them. So we just, a whole model would be around looking at what the client requires and working out the best solutions for them. And how do you think that, you know, with, with the uh, evolving world that we're living in, um, how do you think that the auction houses and the art world has actually evolved with technology, online auctions, and, you know, how, how has it changed? Uh, it's changed enormously, I think, in the last two or three years. So as an auction, I've sort of the migration of auction into the marketplace in terms of retail space, in terms of uh, private clients buying, has been a sort of, I don't know, 10, 15 year um, uh, modern collectors, the sort of 90s onwards, collectors were becoming more comfortable with going to auctions, talking to auctioneers directly, getting advice from them and buying at auction. It's, whereas before it had been predominantly dealers bought at auctions, collectors went to dealers. So there's been that sort of longer term change has been happening a while, but then we had lockdown and that changed an awful lot of things in the market. I mean, there were three things there that changed. The tastes changed, the buying habits changed, and the uh, appetite for it changed. So the taste, what we saw with the property market, you know the property market extremely well, you know what happened to the country house property market in lockdown. People chose to change their lifestyle. And what that did is a number of things. First of all, they planned, they, they bought new things. They needed to fill houses. They changed what they did. They lived at home for a while. They made decisions. Have, you know, busy people don't not spend much time at home. You suddenly spend a lot of time at home. You start deciding to do things. And there was cash because you couldn't go to a restaurant, you couldn't go on holiday and so on. So, and very often they changed that lifestyle, bought another house. And when they did that, I think that changed how they wanted to live. And I think that that helped change the taste. It had been very minimalist contemporary driven up to that point. In lockdown, we saw people, interior designers and collectors directly coming to us, wanting to buy antiques, more traditional areas of collecting, 18th century portraiture not necessarily just to go down that road, or some people have, but to mix it with a more contemporary element. So it was called layering. And I think that stayed, and if that stays, that's a generational change. So that's, that looks like it's happened in lockdown. 
buying habits changed. People started buying online. So people would buy, you know, art, furniture, objects online unseen. I think the, 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 the biggest example of that was in January 2020, we did the Aino Park sale. Aino Park was owned by James Perkins. He had sold Aino Park. He wanted to sell his collection. It was a well-known collection. James has great flair. And it was a mix of, of, of modern, of some traditional, and, of, and his eccentric taste. So lots of taxidermy and so on. And it just caught the imagination. And we thought, do we go with it um, in lockdown? And we did. It was the first virtual house sale. And it was, the pre-sale estimate was 1.5 million. It made 3.2 million. All of it sold. Um, that was a hammer, so with my cream, it's four million. All of it sold, 85% of it sold online. Some telephone bidding, uh, obviously it was, it was a virtual sale. 68% new bidders for us around the world. 10,000 people around the world engaged with it. We had almost 2,000 bidders. It was, it just caught a moment. And that showed us from that point that A, people were out to, to, to collect despite the difficulties of life at the time, that they, that they were willing to buy online, seeing it was secondary to having you know, reliable expert to talk you through it. So we built a lot of online bidding platforms. We did remote viewings. We did all sorts of 360 tours. We, we have a very good imaginative creative team and, and they worked with James to, to put that on all sorts of platforms. We did a lot of video content. Um, and, and it showed just how that sort of We'd had a gradual migration online, but that condensed a sort of 10-year migration into basically 18 months. So there were lots of changes going on at the time, and, and that, that, that sort of last two, three years has, has really seen a lot of change condensed into a short period of time. And, and those who've um, worked with it, generated new um, technologies with it and so on, have, have done quite well because collecting is still cool. It's changing what people are collecting, but it's still just an appetite for it. Do you think there's an influence from uh, people not wanting to waste? So they pass things on from person to person rather than, you know, throwing things away? Or... Yeah, I think so there's, there's definitely an element of that. I think we're much more conscious of, of the throwaway culture, you know, the, the decadent cultures maybe we might have identified in the past. It does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you tell us more about what is an, a specialist? So we talked about how, you know, when you go to a house sale, there might be some things that need more specialist uh, input and, and, and advice. So w what would you call a specialist? Specialist is an expert uh, or someone with a technological expertise in an area. So an expert is like an old master specialist, an old master drawing. So Richard Carroll, our old master drawings expert, he knows about the the dating of paper, the, the, the use of crayon or pencil, you know, all of, someone like that can talk you through and make attributions, help value, help date things. And it, a good specialist will add value. So, you know, jewelry specialists, our jewelry specialists are FGA qualified, so they can identify stones, they can grade stones and so on. So you need someone to give you sound advice, that's a good specialist. But on top of that, they add value. And I think good specialists can help generate more interest through attribution through their network of, of contacts in, in when the client wants to look to sell something. For example, we had um, a few months ago, we, well, a few years ago, we were doing a valuation for a client in a farmhouse in the West Country. Lovely old farmhouse, bit down at, down at the edges, front door always left open, and there on the mantelpiece is a little bronze of a mother and child in lead. And our specialist thought, this could be a Henry Moore sculpture in a farmhouse in the West Country. <laughs> Very relaxed about it. Family didn't really know, although Dad did seem to, you know, know some Henry Moore. The rumour was he had. Anyway, so we thought, OK, well, let's get this looked at. OK, this happened in lockdown, so it was a slow process because of that. But it's a slow process anyway. So we went to the Henry Moore Foundation. Our team, Will Bolton, and Frankie Wisdom, spent um, two years working with the foundation, with notes, with research, to identify this as a Henry Moore sculpture. And they knew that he did work in lead. He didn't have much money in the early days before bronze. So this could be an early mother and child. And sure enough, we worked with Foundation of Foundation, very rarely do this, added it to the catalogue resume. We put it in for sale. 
and it made uh, 400,000 pounds. And it was because how rare is it to get a new annual? But we had, you know, experts had worked with the foundation and established that it was. That's the sort of specialist, that's what a specialist can do in, in terms of adding value for the client and obviously the marketplace. Um, so we touched on the subject that people can go to, to your parent company, Gurjohns, to, to get advice. But for our listeners, if, if they're trying to consider, you know, what's the right auction house for me, what are the sort of things that they should be looking at or considering? I think, I think you need to look at what their sale calendar is and to see where their area of focus is. I think that's the key thing. Um, or if in doubt, like with Gurjohns, you can go to an independent advisor and you know, talk through the options. But when you're narrowing it down to an auction house, you need to know what, what their main area of focus is. So for example, I mentioned Christie's and Sotheby's, they are the big two, but their area of focus is narrowed. For a traditional country house sale, they're probably not something they will focus on and therefore it's possibly you can have other options like a Druitz or someone like that. So I think in terms of expertise, what do they do? And in terms of where they are in terms of the level of where they operate in the market. So for example, it's like a property. You know, if you're selling a major country house, you don't go necessarily to the local auction or local auctioneer value firm or local estate agency, you would go to a, you know, one of the big names. So you just need to know where you are. And also if it's rural property, you might go for somebody who specializes in rural property. It's the same with, with art and antiques. So just be comfortable that it's in their realms of expertise and focus. So a lot of the times this does start from property movement, doesn't it? We do. I mean, yes, it is. There's two things. There's the, there's the sort of long-term relationship in managing collections. But when we're looking at sales and valuing things for, for, for possible dispersal, then you are looking at a lifestyle change. So it is either moving house, so we mirror the property market very much in that way, or it's uh, a death in the family and you know, managing an estate dispersal. Going back to Druids, um, can you tell us about the unique selling points of Druids? Yeah, I think Druids um, is, and with four of our sister company, are now the largest UK auction business outside the big three. So, um, and Druitz in particular, in terms of its expertise, is uh, a bit comparable to what Christie South Kent should be. So it, it is a collections, uh, it's leader in managing collections and house sales of that type. It also has a, a, a very uh, good modern British and contemporary art uh, department. It has jewelry and luxury sales. So it has that contemporary but it also has, it's a leader in, in managing collections, mainly house sales and traditional collections. But you know, we see on the walls around here, uh, an important collection by David Bomberg, that's come in as part of our modern contemporary, but, but presented as a collection to add that sort of interest and, and to give that provenance to the collection that it had when it was put together. So um, it, it, it is a, it's, but it's a general auction business that has experts across all the main uh, collecting areas. And with Forum, they're a specialist in books and manuscripts so, and, and works on paper and modern print. So the main, all the main areas are covered. And, and with sales of uh, 50 million pounds a year, it's, um, it's, it's one of the largest now. And, um, and it's been very creative over the last two years in driving those areas of collecting. Talk to us about your collaborations with, uh, with others in the industry that is not part of your group. Yeah, well, we, we look always to get the best out of um, any sales we have for our clients. So we have, we, 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 our, part of our strategy is to work with other partners in, in the industry, well-respected partners, whose name and um, following will add interest to the sale. So for example, when we did the Sitwell sale for the Sitwell family, for their house in Northamptonshire, um, we partnered with Nina Campbell, and so Nina, uh, very kindly, very generously, wonderful Nina, came down and dressed our London galleries for the preview and Donington Priory, our country house sale for the main exhibition before the sale. And that just gives A, added exposure for the sale, but B, because she has obviously a massive following, but B, it just makes people look, viewings, I mean, I've said we moved into the retail space, all our private collectors, we have a lot of private collectors, can come in and they can visualise things. And it makes them easier to, to access the sale, to, to commit to buying, because they can see how things work. So 
it's it's it, on many levels it's a very successful thing um and uh we've done P peter Himwood got our flaxley abbey in chillum castle sales coming up um and we've done with peter Himwood, who was christopher gibbs partner who, who's helped us with the chillum castle because he did chillum castle for the family there and flaxley abbey is an oliver messel so we've been working with thomas messel uh to do some marketing around that and the history to, to, to Messel's design and this wonderful flair. So we do a lot of partnerships and it works. It works extremely well. And it's not just in collection sales. In our jewellery sales, uh, we've worked with uh, Thomas Storetsky uh, with the uh, Rothschild jewellery and the Rothschild collection. Victoria de Rothschilds was a famous entertainer, not entertainer, um, hostess, loves, yeah, very fascinating individual, loved giving dinner parties. So we did. Um, in our luxury sale and jewellery sale, we did a tablescaping with Thomas, and he did a talk about tablescaping and how it worked, and we talked about how Victoria de Rochetard interest in that area as part of her you know, hospitality. So it was, that again was another, it took it to a different level, and in fact we had a wonderful reaction to that, and I think it, it made five times what we expected it to make. Uh, so yes, partnerships is part of it's part of the effort, part of the imagination, part of the creativity that our team put into you know, any, anything that comes to us for our clients. Um, I'm not an expert in the art world, and Ger Johns is, is, is a discreet name, I think, in, in, in yeah. the art world would be the right thing to say, and they kind of came on the map with a Picasso sale or something, right? Yeah, they, they, well, they, they bought a number of Picassos for clients. So the auction business is about noise and theatre and, and, and you know, accessibility and, and so on. I think the independent art advisory bit with Gurjons is a different animal. And there's a big wall between the two because their independence is sacrosanct and clients want to go there quietly. They want quiet, professional advice before anything happens. They need time to talk things through. And Gurjons, I mean, they, they value, they, they're talking to collections worth over $3 billion annually. Um, so there's some major pieces in there, and yes, th that's a very, very quiet, um, expert-driven, independent advice. And that allows you space to look at all the options, whether private sales, whether it's evening sales in New York, or whichever you want to do to achieve the best returns, if you're looking at dispersals, but also in collecting. So they, they do a lot of buying for clients, they build, help build collections for clients, um, and sometimes that's in our sales, so in the um, Aino Park sale, we had a Triceratops skull that was bought by a Gerd John's client because he was interested in buying dinosaurs. It was a rare opportunity to get a Triceratops skull. So, I mean, there's crossover in that respect, but, but they're, they're an independent art advisory business and, yes, much quieter and, and uh, less high profile. Um, so talk to us about um, international um, clients, if somebody's listening to you from, from somewhere else in the world, what, what's your reach and influence in, in, in other countries? Well, many of our sales are, are bought by 45, 50 countries, you know, we're buyers in 45 to 50 countries. So um, our buying base is truly international. I mean, with Gerd Johns, we have offices in Hong Kong, we buy in America, New York, and so on. So, so we have reach around the world, but certainly in terms of our auctions, it's a very much an international buying base. Um, and so we use um, careful shippers. We, we obviously have the um, ability to bring things on on TA for things coming in from abroad. Um, but that for, for our international clients, it's important that they get the best service. They need to know um, that the, the, the export licenses and all the paperwork is managed. One of our um, businesses is um, our ma rare manuscripts business. That's very international, but also is very, we have to very, very carefully manage any exports because the protocols around that are extremely tight, quite correctly. Um, so that shipping expertise is something they can call on as well. And that, that's part of the relationship we have with our international buying base. But selling is, is mainly from UK sellers? No, we have international sellers as well. It is mainly UK, but we do have international sellers as well. And especially with our uh, John's colleagues, you know, they're dealing with a truly international global collecting base. I guess it also depends on the size of things, whether you can sh bring them. Exactly. I mean, it's not necessarily <laughs> worth bringing, you know, a, yeah. a, a 500 pound picture halfway around the world. But no, we do. I mean, we do bring in, I've got some uh, um, important pieces coming from the States for, 
for our spring sales. So yeah, it, it does happen and it's very manageable, but you need to look at that with your client and is it the best option, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. And thank it's you. really been uh, interesting listening to you and learning a little bit about the world of auctions. And obviously for our listeners, they can contact you through our experts directory and uh, you'll be able to help them along absolutely. this journey. Absolutely, very happy to take any inquiries and then discuss what's needed and point them in the right direction. No problem at all. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another insightful conversation with one of our experts. For experts like Will and many others, for all aspects of your real estate needs, please head over to our experts directory and uh, feel free to get in touch if you need more specialist help. Thanks for listening to the London Property Podcast. Head over to londonproperty.co.uk and subscribe to our newsletter to receive latest updates.